I'm going to talk about neurofeedback. Um, it's a way of communicating with machines using the power of thought. So I'm going to introduce you to myself and how I actually got there. Uh, but before I do that, I want to open the presentation and also want to close the presentation with the following statement uh, from Arthur C. Clarke. That goes, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Just think about it. So, what am I? Um, I'm an engineer above all, and I have two passions. Uh, first is robotics, and um, this is a couple of slides uh, from different types of robotics that I work with. This is an industrial manipulator uh, by KUKA uh, on the assembly line uh, building uh, cars. This is a research type of uh, robotics device that goes to Mars and explores uh, planets in our solar system. And this is a bit of a military um, robotic manipulator, or oh, it's, it's an autonomous device. This is one part of my passion. The other is intelligence. I'm interested in intelligent machines, and I'm also interested in um, human intelligence. And the organ that's responsible for human intelligence is our brain. And it is one of the most complicated, uh, least understood organs in the human body. And it is very complex. So how did it all come about? Well, in 1991, came out when I was an impressionable kid, uh, came out a movie by James Cameron um, called Terminator 2. And I got really, really excited. I wanted to be that guy in the film, and I wanted to develop a Terminator arm. And I wanted to be able to control it. So after school, uh, I went to the University of Reading in the United Kingdom, uh, where I met some very peculiar and interesting people. Well. My dream kind of got ruined because this guy uh, over there, Professor Peter Kybert, has already developed an arm when I just entered the university. It, it has three fingers and it's not very advanced, but um, it can hold things and there, there are some sensors in the, uh, in the fingers there. Um, it, it's moved by some uh, server motors and it has a microchip. So, you know, it, it, is a, it is a manipulator uh, above all. The other person that really inspired me is this guy. Um, he's over there. Some of you may or may not know him. Uh, it's a Professor Kevin Warwick. Um, he is the first human being uh, who has joined technology with the human body um, in the sequences of two experiments. The first one was an uh, experiment called Cyborg 1. Not very, um, not very unique name there. But what he has done, is he has implanted an RFID tag into his left arm. And um, everybody here uh, has an RFID tag in your mobile phone or in, uh, in a bank card. So it's not very exciting technology, it's very passive. The second experiment was a little bit more advanced. And on the, on, on the screen here, you can see um, he has implanted surgically a 100 array uh, electrode chip into his myonic nerve in the left arm. And on the screen, you can see um, at any given time, they were able to access um, and simulate 25 electrodes out of 100. So together with Peter Kybert, um, Kevin has joined um, Peter's arm and his own body. Uh, and using his own body, his own electrical signals, he was able to control a robotic arm. And not only was he able to control it, but he was able to feel what the arm is feeling. So th this was the first two-way communication between the human body and the machine. And it, it, it really have got me thinking and thinking like, what, how can I expand the body? How can I develop technologies that will revolutionize the world? Straight after university, I went and worked on nuclear fusion devices. And I worked for a company called Oxford Technologies. And we developed robotic manipulators, this one, um, that go inside the nuclear fusion machine and performs um, maintenance work. They do cleaning, they do inspection, they do uh, welding, they do cutting. It's a very, it's a little bit like a, a hammer. <laughs> it, it is, even though it is advanced, but it is very simple in, in the way how it works. And they, these manipulators, they date back to 1960s, uh, to Manhattan Experiment. And back then in those days, they only were mechanical. There was no electrical connections. But today, this is delivered on the 15 meter long snake manipulator. It weighs tons and tons, and um, we have a, a, an operator sitting in the in the control room, which I will show you a picture. The this is an example. Th this is actually the reactor that I worked on uh, together with uh, my colleagues. Um, 
it's a big donut and it's a hollow donut and inside um, those who, who say that oh we haven't achieved fusion and you know we, uh, no we have and we were able uh, to get the same reaction that's going on the sun and we were able to achieve the temperatures 10 times the core of the sun here on earth we were able to defy um, we were able to play god we can get purer vacuum than space and we can get temperatures hotter than the sun so inside inside the reactor we were able to get to 150 million celsius now going back to um, synergy between human beings and machines <clears throat> this is an example of um, uh, of an operator sitting there and he has a machine and he can see the other robot inside the manipulator kinematically they are identical and the controller the operator can feel exactly what the machine is feeling the weight uh, the structure uh, he can't feel the the temperature but he shouldn't um, it's a little bit hot, but 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 he can work with things. He understands. It is exactly like using a hammer. You can you can feel what you're doing. But the problem with this is you have a lot of cameras and um, you have a 3D model as well. And if you're working, if you're trying to sort of to put uh, a nut and a bolt together, you need to move a camera. So you you do a little bit and then you let go of the manipulator and you walk away. And you take the camera and you sort of move it and you use a joystick and you adjust the light and then you come back and you grab hold of it and do a little bit more and then you go and do the same. It takes a very long time. Uh, they work 20, uh, the, the shift goes for 24 hours uh, and every seven hours um, operators change. It is very complicated. So I wanted to um, give ability to these guys, to these guys over there, control the devices around them using a power of thought. How amazing would it be if you could just think about it, look, I want to adjust the camera angle and the camera just moves. Well, I want to get some light because I can't see very well and the light adjusts. So this is what I dedicated myself after working in this company. I uh, joined the research group at the uh, National Trondheim University. And uh, I work on next generation robotics and uh, another part of my research is on the um, human machine interface, but particularly on the brains. Oh, you can't see very well here, but <clears throat> what is a brain? A brain is an electromagnetic device. Um, it generates electrical pulses, and those pulses flow down your body uh, through the nerve system, and you can feel, and you can manipulate things, and you can um, control the world around you. To, I want to sort of go back in 2003, and uh, uh, in TED, um, there was a, a TED talk in 2003 by a guy called Jeff Hawkins. And he, back then, he said that we don't really have a theory that describes brain. We don't even have a framework that describes how the brain works. Well, 10 years further, we are a little bit closer, but we still don't understand quite a lot about it. We don't know how the brain encodes the signal. We don't know how the information is really stored. We do know where, uh, which parts of the brain are responsible for what. And we do have some technologies to help us monitor the brain activity. And there's two examples. Uh, the one on the left is an MRI. It allows us to take a picture of a brain activity at any given time. Uh, it's, very, it's fairly accurate, uh, but it is incredibly big. So could you imagine if you're sitting in the office and there's this machine sitting right above your head? Uh, impossible. <laughs> The other one is, um, is a little bit smaller, and it's an EEG cap, and some of you might have been in a hospital who had to do um, an um, EEG scan. It's a hat with a lot of electrodes and a lot of wires coming out. Now, if you can imagine, if I have to tell you that tomorrow when you come to your office, you have to wear it, and you have to wear it all day long, even when you go to the toilet, you're not going to do that, are you? No, I wouldn't. <laughs> so. Um, I decided that, look, what we're going to do is we're going to go and try and buy uh, something that anybody can buy. And, and here in my hand I have, uh, have a device uh, by um, uh, Neurosky. It's called a MindWave and it has one sensor here. Now, the problem with the brain, it has billions and billions of cells. And they all speak in slightly different language to each other. Uh, they operate a little bit differently and they have their own um, areas of expertise. Now, imagine we are in a room like this, but a little bit bigger, 
and in that room is 60 billion people, so 10 times the people on Earth. And I'm standing with this microphone, and I want to hear what people right over there are talking about. I want, to, I want to really know what they're planning, you know, what, what are they talking about. So I take my microphone and try and listen, and everybody speaks at the same time, so it's just noise. Well, you can imagine it's pretty impossible. But given mathematics and given statistics, we can understand based upon the location where these people are. Are they planning to move an arm? Or are they responding to an external stimulus, like a click or a flash? Or are they just storing memory or are they processing some other um, form of signals? So what I've done is we, we, did, we, we started doing these experiments and um, we used a slightly different device to this one. Uh, it's by, new, um, by Emotive. Uh, it has 14 sensors instead of one, so we, are a little bit, we have a little bit more microphones. Um, and you can't really see, unfortunately, there is a mani manipulator. It's like in the first slide. It's an industrial machine. Um, it's not very fast, but it's enough to, to sort of do some gluing, do some sewing. So we decided, so we started monitoring the brain signals, and um, brain signals are a little bit chaotic, but it's okay because there is order in chaos. You can find order in everything, but we need to know what we're looking for. So the, with all the um, neuroscientists and brain researchers, they identified certain signals that we can rely on as a way of controlling um, different sort of um, objects. And I'm going to show you some of them. So this is a readout from the 14 sensors that we have. And it's, you can see it's just you know, very, very small fluctuation in voltages. They, you can't really make sense of it. But when you apply mathematics and uh, statistics and do a little bit of scientific transformation, which I'm really excited about, um, you can start seeing the order. And the, the elements that we have focused on is this one is called the ERP. Um, when we uh, operate, when we communicate with the world, we build models. So I have a model of people, and I have a model of this, and I have a model of this in my head. And if th something goes wrong, if I look at this and uh, it starts to hit me and it hurts me, in my brain I have a signal just like that one that goes, hey, something's going wrong. And we can detect this. So as an operator, operating on a nuclear fusion device, and we're doing some work, sometimes personal experience, we were building a manipulator and at 3 o'clock in the morning uh, we were doing a final test to see if the manipulator operational and it's ready to, uh, to do work. My fault. Um, I come into the control uh, cubicle, I turn the system on and I run the test. And at that moment, that manipulator accelerates and destroys itself. We had a, we had, my colleague was standing holding uh, his hand on electrical stop. But it, since it happened very, very fast, by the time he pressed stop, the manipulator destroyed itself. However, the brain will respond a lot quicker. And if we had a system that could read my mind and detect that there's something going wrong, we could stop the system before it's too late. Imagine there's been a close calls when I was touching a manipulator, a big manipulator that can lift 200 kilograms, can move it at two and a half meters a second. And the manipulator started moving. And I just had enough time to jump. Imagine a situation where I didn't have the time to jump and it hit me and I'm hurting and I'm uh, laying on the floor and I lost the control of my body. And the manipulator is about to completely kill me. But I have a device on my head that I can trigger the stop and call for help. This is my motivation. We, I want to give people who have lost the ability to walk, control their bodies, due to disease or uh, due to uh, an incident or accident, I want to give them the ability to be free again. The other signal that we focused on is um, something called the P300. When I click my fingers, 300 milliseconds after, in your head will be a spike. So if I keep clicking like this, or flashing a light, if I monitor your brain, I will know if you're paying attention to what I'm doing, depending um, if, if the frequency of the flashes or the clicks uh, correspond to those peaks. And the final one, and a really interesting one, it's called the motor imagery. When you think and when you move your arm, your brain generates signals. Uh, this is actually a picture from the um, University of Howard uh, in the United States. 
um, they made people watch YouTube videos and they recorded the brain activity. So this is the brain activity uh, on the left hand side of people watching YouTube videos. Then they asked the same people to reproduce the videos in their heads, to sort of imagine the videos. And this is the brain activity when they watch, the, uh, when they reproduce the videos in their head. And on the left is a difference. Very little difference, if, if any. What it means is that when you move your arm and when you think about moving your arm, the set of signals that generated by your brain is exactly the same. If we can intercept them and understand how it's encoded, we can control robotic manipulator to feed you, to give you water, uh, to, to open the door, to turn on the camera, uh, to, to, to start a car, to make you tea. And I, I want to close this speech, uh, the, the, this talk, with um, exactly the same statement as I opened it. And, but I just want to make a little adjustment. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And my correction is this. Is magic is only a small step away from the reality. And mathematics, science, and engineering will make that reality possible. Thank you very much. Yeah.